Good. Okay, we are now officially beginning. Welcome to the Wildly Museum's third webinar. We're actually being hosted by our uh, guest speaker today, Nick Stover. And I just want to give you a little background first on the museum. Um, I see a lot of names that I know that are museum um, members and supporters, but I see a lot of other names as well. So welcome to everybody. Um, for those that are not super familiar with the Wildly Museum, we're here in lovely Solvang, um, California. We've been here about almost seven years. In August, it'll be seven years at this location, and we're uh, all focused on art and nature. Um, we like to blend the two. We like to use art to help tell the stories about the environment, to inspire people to care about the environment, uh, species, especially endangered species, and uh, you know, make efforts to help preserve and conserve this for future generations. Um, and we do this through all kinds of programs, through all kinds of exhibitions, and we take a really wide swath of what kinds of mediums we like to show here. And photography is definitely something that we really respect and include in a lot of our exhibitions. Um, we are in the middle of our, uh, I can't say annual now, but a, a regular ongoing nature photography competition. And Nick is our uh, volunteer judge this year. We just love working with him. He's been wonderful. And uh, if, in case anybody here is, uh, knows about the competition, we had over 200 entries. So uh, we inadvertently gave Nick a big job when yeah. we invited him awesome. to, to do this. Um, so Nick grew up in uh, Western Colorado and uh, now uh, lives and works in San Luis Obispo. And he teaches photography classes, workshops, um, offers critiquing workshops, does all kinds of wonderful stuff. We found out about him when he entered our California Parks and Monuments um, juried exhibition last year. And I uh, loved his work there and reached out to him a bit. And he now has work that's in our gift shop. And, um, and again, we reached out to him and to be a judge for the current photo competition. And, and like I said, he's just been fantastic to work with. And if you've checked out his website, you'll see he's uh, got a wonderful uh, portfolio of work from all over the country, um, but he really does love the Central Coast and you'll see a lot of, lot of work from that. And so today's talk is, I think, focused primarily on the Central Coast in California and those wonderful wild landscape areas that we all love. So with that, um, take it away, Nick. Sounds great. Well, I appreciate everybody coming. We had great, uh, great turnout here, and uh, some of my regular uh, workshop participants are uh, going. Why aren't we? Um, why aren't we able to see our video or talk? And this one has too many people for us to unfortunately promote everyone to panelists. So, uh, question and answers uh, can go into the chat. Uh, there's a there's a chat function, and there's also a Q and A. And we have saved some time at the end to go through questions. Uh, so anyone has questions, feel free to jump, uh, dump them in there and we'll go from there. So that being said, I'm going to share my screen. Should be seeing some Lupin right now. If I correctly did it. Somebody confirm that. Stacy or Lauren? Oh, both on yes, we're seeing that. Okay. We're seeing Great. All right, well, now I'll start the presentation then. Okay, right. Well, that being said, I have hit record. We are ready to go. So I'm glad to be here today. And be but before I jump into the meat of my presentation, my presentation, uh, I needed to clear the air uh, and get something out there from the very beginning. No, that's not my mission statement. We need to talk about. Um, and I didn't have to take a pledge when I became a California resident, uh, which happened in 2012 nor did I have to sign a document to become a photographer, but I'm pretty sure there is some loophole in California law that says if I do a presentation on California nature photography, and I don't at least have a few sunset photos of the ocean, I might be asked to leave. Uh, so rather than be asked to leave this, this state, I would wanted to uh, check the box and be done with this kind of up front. Uh, so let's check the box and be done with it as we take in this image of the Oceano Dunes uh, and the sun that's poking through the tiny layer of the in between the fog and the marine layer. Okay, and then we can go to Shell Beach and on a super low king tide, take in a sunset image with colors, contrasts, and textures. 
the blues, greens, and yellows all playing together with the textures of the water, the silkiness of the seaweed, and the firm contrast of the rock. So now that you've gotten to see the sunset images of the ocean, I get to be allowed to continue my presentation and we all win. Oh, I guess there is one more thing. As a resident of Slow County, if I didn't include a picture of Mora Rock, I think my property taxes are set to triple. So now that I've cleared the air with that and the sunset presentations, let's get on with the presentation. So I really appreciate being here today and to talk about something to core to who I am. Uh, adventure, California, and oh yeah, that thing called nature photography. So adventure can have many meanings based on a wide variety of things from personal level of comfort to levels of experience that one does or maybe doesn't have. Adventure to me is not meant to be thrill seeking or hazardous, but it is all about discovery and experience. So with that in mind, today is going to focus on the exploration of unknown territories and much less on the hazardous side, side of adventure that some seek. I don't think the environmental crusader Edward Abbey was complimenting California with this quote. And while we all grumble when it comes to California taxes, or our long list of regulations, or how crowded it can feel when we're out and about with the 39 other million people that call this state home, or the estimated 300 million, yes, 300 million people that visit California every year. So the good news for most of us is these people are in the major cities and not in the remote areas like the Darwin Bench here in the Sierras. And where I saw a place I didn't see another soul for the 48 hours I was there, completely immersed in the massiveness of the Sierra Range, swimming in the sun warm lakes and avoiding the flocks of mosquitoes. Yes, even paradise has its downsides. So I jokingly call California the state of EST, that's E-S-T, not Eastern Standard Time, not extrasensory telepathy. It's the land of the highest, lowest, oldest, hottest, but it's also the diversest from our mountains to our oceans and our deserts. Mount Whitney is the continental U.S. tallest peak at 14,491 feet. It stands majestically as the anchor of the Sierras through the Mobius Arch here in the Alabama Hills. It's a difficult to obtain a permit to summit Mount Whitney and it's a very long day hike of 6,000 vertical feet and 22 miles round trip, not to mention the 99 notorious switchbacks. And while adventure is certainly up there, it can also be found with a telephoto lens here and a cup of coffee below. 100 miles away, we go to a depth of 280 feet below sea level. It is not unheard of or uncommon to have temperature differences of 100 degrees between the these two spots. Two days ago, yes, just 48 hours ago, the mercury in Death Valley hit 128 degrees. It's the hottest temperature recorded on the earth in the last three years. The salt flats of Badwater are a fantastic sight to behold with the patterns and textures of the salt pans that puzzle the eyes and the mind. It just may not be a place to venture in July unless your definition of venture of adventure is heat stroke. So what other things can we claim as Californians? Well, some clues lie in our state seal. Symbols on the state seal include 31 stars, the number of states before California was admitted. The woman, Minerva, which is the Roman goddess of wisdom. The grizzly bear, which is our official state animal. Grapes, signifying our agricultural rich richness a minor, the history of our California gold rush, and Eureka, our state motto, which means I've found it. Eureka, I have found it. Well, since I'm no, not a gold miner, I only can think that they're referring to the beauty. So where can we find it? Our official state animal. The official California state animal is actually ex extinct within California and has been since 1922. These powerful carnivores were once common in the state, but early settlers couldn't find a way to coexist with them, and 98 years ago, the last grizzly was killed in Tulare County. So this otter doesn't laugh at the demise of the grizzly, as they too were once threatened to the brink of extinction, but maybe rather questions why the bear was put on our flag and made our official animal in the 1950s, over 30 years after it was made extinct. So what else do we want to claim? oldest. 
The bristlecone pines of the White Mountains above Bishop reach 5,000 years old. These trees predate the creation of paper and the written word and are older than the Egyptian civilization. They grow about the diameter of a toothpick a year. Walking among these ancients, you feel like you're in a curated art museum with their fascinating shapes and the textures of their trunks that have weathered and withstood brutal winters and hot summers. What about bluest or clearest? Lake Tahoe makes this claim along with being the largest alpine lake in the United States. Eagle Falls here, which overlooks Emerald Bay, was a fantastic place to watch a sunrise as most of Lake Tahoe slept. But what about us, the Lupin asks. We are blue, we are tall, we are great. While those facts are all true about the Lupin of California, the nod goes to the poppy as the official state flower, even as we find glorious stands of the Lupin in the spring months along the central coast. So we have the tallest mountains, <clears throat> the oldest trees, what about the tallest sand dunes? We don't get that honor, but we do get some amazing majesty in places like the Kelso Dunes and the Mojave Natural Preserve. So I'm human. I recognize our need for money as a society, but I wanna say how much I appreciate our money. Not the money in our bank accounts or the flimsy $3 that's in my money clip right now. The state quarter of California. If you ever doubt the impacts that one man or woman can have on this world, think of John Muir. John Muir, pictured here on the California Quarter, is the naturalist and conservationist who helped form the Sierra Club in 1892 and was instrumental in getting Yosemite declared as a national park. He went on to influence countless others to take action to protect places in his legacy that can be found all over the state, such as Half Dome, Pictured here, the granite rock formation is the, the iconic symbol of Yosemite Valley and known around the world. Or the California condor, with a wingspan of nine feet, this big North American land bird, land bird is still in danger of extinction, but the good news is after over 50 years, they recently returned to Sequoia National Park earlier this month. So I did thank John Muir on this April morning on the Mist Trail in Yosemite. As the torrent, as the water thum, thundered over Vernal Falls and the light, light poked through to light up the mist from this raging torrent, I was grateful that John Muir pushed so hard to protect places like this and that I could bear witness to something as magnificent and in the same manner as he likely did 130 years before me. And I also wanted to thank him on this day as I emerged from the wilderness carrying his name, the John Muir Wilderness, and into the spectacular Ducey Basin, just steps away from the John Muir Trail, which heads up and over Muir Pass, passing through the high mountain lakes of Wanda and Helen that he thought so highly of that he named them for his only daughters. Well, we didn't start the first national park, but we can claim another ST or EST. Most, most national parks. We have nine national parks in California. Alaska II. We also have 13 national monuments. Five national trails proving that all roads do in some way lead to California. 146 national historic landmarks, most of which are not natural landscapes but contribute to our history as a state. One national seashore, Point Reyes, which is spectacular from the Roosevelt Elk to the hidden beaches and the misty walks among the trees. We have three national recreation areas, Golden Gate just outside San Francisco, still one of my all time favorite places to trail run, Santa Monica to the north of LA, and Whiskey Town around the Mount Shasta area in Northern California. And just when you start to get bored with the national and historical sites, we have 280 state parks over 340 miles of coastline, 970 miles of lake and river frontage, 4,500 miles of trails. This is the most diverse natural and cultural heritage holdings of any state and agency in the nation. And finally, and I do mean finally, there are 149 wilderness areas in California, raising in size from a few thousand to hundreds of thousands of acres. The largest being, yes, the John Muir Wilderness. 
So where do we start? I think we've established that adventure is certainly out there within the state of California. So let's start by relaxing. Let's take a journey to the Channel Islands where you can snag a camp spot among 10,000 seagulls, a little sun deafening, but do a short walk to Inspiration Point on Anacapa Island for a most breathtaking view. Island Packers runs boat shuttles from Ventura and Oxnard to, all, to five of the Channel Islands and all of them allow camping. Easy to get to and easy to get around. Or choose to attempt one of the more difficult challenges, Ocean Milky Way. Fighting the light of the distant cities, the marine layer and the fog still proves to be a challenge worth undertaking. Remember when I mentioned those 10,000 seagulls? Yeah, they were a little creepy as I walked through the dark to my own roost for this image. But possibly we need to get grounded with the big trees in Sequoia, where we can revel in the most difficult things in California to possibly take pictures of, giant sequoias. I'll keep trying though, trying different angles and different conditions as these sequoias are magical. Reaching 300 feet in height and 30 feet in diameter, these giants are worth the time to examine. As a bonus tip, sequoias are not just in Sequoia. There's an amazing grove called the Mariposa Grove as you enter into Yosemite, and Kings Canyon has several groves as well. So I think we've determined to avoid Death Valley in the summer months, <clears throat> but within a very short distance of the road, you can walk the Mesquite Flat sand dunes and experience some of the uniqueness of the sand and the shapes it takes in the evening light. <clears throat> or drop down into one of the valleys and take in the mud cracks between some of the high dunes as you watch the setting sun. Some things, they just never get old and need to be seen at least once or twice or 25 times in your lifetime. Now I'm talking about Yosemite. Now is actually the ideal time to go to Yosemite as they have a reservation system that's greatly reducing the number of people that are allowed to enter the park. I actually leave on Friday and I can report back but snagging a permit can be easier than you think. Bonus tip, when open, the Iwani Hotel, Hotel has a most amazing Sunday brunch, perfect after a long hike. This image was taken from Cook's Meadows. As many of you know, tunnel view can be quite crowded, but valley view is less crowded, at least it was on that Sunday evening when I sat here. If solitude is more of your thing, maybe opt for Lassen National Park which sees one-tenth of the visitors of Yosemite. And even on 4th of July weekend last year, we scored a spot in the campground. Bonus, and for 10 bucks, you have the right, and if you have the right rig, you can sleep right in the visitor center parking lot. Still listed as me on many websites as a national monument and forgotten by many others, but worth a stop, Pinnacles National Park. No backpacking but loads and loads of condors, which, kept Jerma, which keep John Muir company on the state border. Balcony's trail was my favorite trail, and a nice campground at the base of the Pinnacles with a decent general store was a fine place to base and do some day hikes. Kings Canyon National Park is a less easy park to see. There are some sweeping vistas, but a large portion of its backcountry requires some work or effort to go see. This is Zamalt Meadows, in 2017 after an exceptionally wet winter. The Kings River had overflown the banks and taken over the trail. Close by car, close by car camping in Yosemite like views with a fraction of the people make it a place worth going in my book, especially if you combine it with a trip to Sequoia, which is immediately adjacent to it. This is the more extreme adventure, the Sierra High Route. 195 mile largely off trail and almost completely above Timberline Trek that starts in Kings Canyon and ends in Mono Village north of Yosemite. Yosemite. With each step above Timberline, the views only got more and more magnificent as Goff Lakes below still had snow and ice in mid-August. But we know there's a different type of California along the Central Coast. The magic is on the Central Coast. In places like this in Montana to Oro, where the wind was whipping as 18 foot waves came to their abrupt conclusion on the cliffs and the rocks in front of me. The Central Coast also brings out great beauty, like the Arroyo Hondo Spires on a marine layer foggy sunset evening. 
What you cannot see in this image is the field of poison oak I'm standing in and learning the hard lesson that the thicker the thicket and the longer the exposure, the more likely it is to penetrate through multiple layers of clothing. Lesson learned yet again. But we're oftentimes stymied in the southern month, summer months with a marine layer. But sometimes we find the cracks in between the clouds that can bring out some nice spotlighting on a crashing wave. Or we can select a more adventurous way to get into and witness sunrise from a sea cave somewhere along the coast. Hint, it takes a kayak to see this one. A favorite place of mine is the Oceano Dunes where the sand meets the water and the sky touches it all. Yes, the southern part is open to dune buggies, but in between the crowds of Pismo and the chaos of the sand, of the sand seekers are miles of untracked and during the week untouched segments of sand. But don't limit your time or yourself to the daytime hours of the Oceano Dunes with great opportunities for night photography. A personal favorite and one of the reasons we moved to SLO is Montana to Oro. Unique pockets of rock, an abundance of hiking trails, great surfing, and no fees for admission. Oh yeah, the campground is also pretty awesome, tucked into the hill and alongside Islay Creek. Find the right combination of a storm and sun, and you can see a nice sea froth whipped up, which can make for some interesting images. And to think that most people think Paso Robles is for drinking wine. I thought it was for the marvelous oaks, which if you time it right, you can get the marine layer coming up and over the hills in Morro Bay to give you interesting light and a pleasant backdrop. But don't forget the little ones on this journey. The numbers are nowhere close to what they used to be, but seeing the monarch clusters in Pismo is certainly worth it. Even with all the obvious and all the known places, California still has its secrets. The Trona Pinnacles. It's a funky arrangement of almost 500 tufa spires, some reaching 550 foot in height. A good distance away from anywhere, but the most otherworldly place I've been to in California. Probably only a few degrees cooler than Death Valley, so beware. And easily one of the windiest places I have been, but it was strangely haunting yet fascinating to be moved by these oddities, and I look forward to returning. And the bristle cones we talked about earlier. They may not be a secret, uh, but they sure felt like they were. We hardly saw a soul in our time up there just this last June. There are so many more groves than the two that appear on the map, and the shapes, the form, and, shapes and forms they take get even more mysterious in the various passing and changing light. Looking eyeball across at the Sierras, you get an opportunity to see the clouds at a much higher view, promoting way interesting sunsets. Places that you think you've heard of, but have probably not thought to go, like Mojave. Everyone thinks Joshua Tree, the Joshua Trees and Joshua Tree, but Sema Road in the Mojave National Preserve actually has more Joshua Trees than Joshua Trees. Than Joshua Tree, excuse me. That's a lot of Joshua Trees. And just as the sun rises, it creates a backlit glow on the desert cacti. It is tough sometimes to find a composition that makes order out of all the chaos in the desert. And this still remains a mystery to me. This is Pirate's Cove on the border of Shell Beach and Avila Beach that is presided by and was seen over by the city of Pismo Beach. This small area has two arches, two sea caves, and zero protections. The topside parking lot is a mess of trash and graffiti. On a weekend, the partying in this area can be absolutely absurd. But it's not even a city park. It's not even on most maps. And it's one of the most beautiful areas on the coast, unprotected and exposed, proving that not all places need to be on a map or have names to be interesting. Some of you may have seen this image. It's a short walk down from a much more visited place of Devil's Postpile National Monument and you get to Rainbow Falls. If you go early, you avoid needing to take the shuttle from Mammoth, and you also avoid most other people. It was just me this fine September morning as I watched the trickle of water come over the mighty San Joaquin. 
But if you ever get bored of all of California's grand landscapes, places to see, there's endless amounts right by your feet, like this image I call the heart of stone on the John Muir Trail. Or the enchanting patterns I recently found in a foxtail pine above 10,000 feet as old branches had been grown upon and around over time and swirls and swirls of the tree sucked me in. Or the golden beauty of the granite of the Sierras reflecting on a high mountain lake at sunrise. Or the mystery of the wisps of the water of Yosemite Falls as they complete their 1800 foot journey to the valley below. So where to start, how to refine, what to do. Next portion we'll talk about is some tools, some tricks, some things to talk about for your own photography. In displaying my work and working with clients, inevitably I'll get the question, you must have a pretty great camera or what kind of cram camera do you have? I still kind of find it an odd question, even though I never get offended. Because I think about when was the last time you had a tasty dinner at someone's home and complimented them by saying, Great meal, you must have a really nice stove. There is so much refinement and patience that goes into the creative process. The quality of the camera is the least of your concerns. The quality of my camera and the Los Osos Oaks this morning, that morning, had no impact on the final image. So what makes my job, what makes me better than any other tool in my photography arsenal? It's a $10 app called Photo Pills. With Photo Pills, I can pre-plan where my sun or my Milky Way should be. Sun on the left, Milky Way on the thing on the right. I can calculate my exposure times if I need to put on filters or understand what I'm dealing with. It can help me get the right distances, focal distances, focus distances, etc. I can see exactly where and at what time the sun will rise or set. I'll be able to turn determine the number of the phases of the moon and where things are going to be happening. Plus there's tons and tons of free tutorials. These tools sound small, but photography, at least for me, is not a spray and pray type of event. I oftentimes get fortunate to have things align, but many times I need to understand how to balance the various variables at play to maximize my time. Take for example this image of the Pointestero shipwreck in Cayucas. I needed to pre-plan how the North Star, the only star in the sky that doesn't move, would line up with this boat. I needed to know what the tides would be doing. I had to check the weather to find an evening to get clear skies in January. Not an easy thing on the Central Coast. Then I got to sit on a cold rock in the ocean and watch my planning unfold over the next two hours. Similar thing here. I wanted to capture an image of the flowers and the oaks with the Milky Way as a backdrop. Knowing exactly where the Milky Way would be and at what time saved me precious sleep, which is more important to me than the camera I use, the car I drive, or the place I live, sleep. Not sure photo pills needs help with marketing, but maybe the tagline, sleep, we know you want it, could help to sell a couple more apps. And the final thing on photo pills was, is being out in an area and finding a dramatic leading line that could lead to or create a compelling image, but needing to time it or know when it'll be there. So this place in Montana to Oro, as I witnessed this great line leading out into the ocean and pulled out the photo pills app and determined that about six months later, the sun would be aligned at the end of this trough of waves leading out into the ocean gave me a pretty good excuse to grab the camera bag and head out at that point in time. So <clears throat> photo pills is a huge tool. The next big thing that I can't encourage you enough to do in your photography is photographing in what is called raw format. Raw, R-A-W. It actually doesn't stand for anything much like anything else. All it means is that unpolished and unprocessed. Your camera, in raw mode is set to grab in as much light and detail as it can. 
The biggest thing this does, and where I can say to you, is it gives you control. You get to choose what you want to see in the image, not your camera. When you shoot JPEG, the camera processes your shot. It makes the determinations. Thus, you lose flexibility. You close off future options. If you don't want to save the raw files as you think they're too big or you don't want to process them, get an external drive. They're about 100 bucks now, two gigabytes to four gigabytes of storage, and keep your RAWs if you ever want to. All cameras that can capture a raw image can also concurrently capture JPEG images, giving you this opportunity to make your changes later. The next thing, or the third thing I'd say, um, which is way more that we can talk about in a few minutes, <clears throat> is it's key to learn how to photograph in manual mode versus auto. This is the key to photography. Understanding the three main control elements in your camera and how you're, they play together in your camera is how you can really compel, create more compelling images. <clears throat> Don't know how to photograph in manual mode? Just Google exposure triangle. Come take one of my classes or just drop me an email. We'll talk about it. So <clears throat> how do I build my places to go? Um, many people ask, where do you find these places? How do you find these places? And I'd say it does start with a good guide. Uh, these are not the be all end all for anything, <clears throat> nor should they be. You should always be looking to train your eyes to see what is in front of you and make changes to what is there. But to get a good sense of the places and what opportunities exist, these two books are great resources. Photograph in California, the northern part, and Photograph in California, the southern part. The next one, well, hello, my name is Nick, and <clears throat> I'm a map addict. I spend hours poring over maps from all places, seeing where things lead, looking at topo lines, reading the features of the land to understand what is out there and the possibilities. Hand in hand with good maps is Google Maps. You can save locations you want to go, search through images that others have posted of areas around there, get pinpoint accurate driving time to get places you want to be. For the bigger dork, i.e. me, the bigger dork, Google Earth becomes even more interesting. You can do aerial flyovers, mark places you want to go, get a sense of the contours of the land in a 3D format. All this is for free. And of course, you save the best for last, your eyes. All of this means that you free your mind and the feel to look at and create work through the lens of who you are and how you see the world. So <clears throat> before I leave you and we go over to Q&A, I want to have a word from our sponsor. Sponsor in this case being me. Um, I have ongoing online photography classes. I have two upcoming workshops on desert photography and light and exposure. Uh, with another round of classes starting in later in August and into September. Uh, rest assured, if for any reason you take one of my classes and you're not satisfied with the workshop, no questions asked, 100% money back guarantee. So you really have nothing to lose. 96% of my workshop participants take one, more than one class, so you're in good company. And then the final thing on this before we do the Q&A and turn it back over to, to Stacy and Lauren is, I also have pre-recorded tutorials that are very, very cost effective. Uh, eight, currently have nine different tutorials, everything from image composition to field planning, uh, scene considerations and processing. These are $15 each uh, on my website, pre-recorded. You can go to my website, stoverphoto.com slash tutorials uh, to get this information. I also have a bunch of free uh, presentations on my website. If you go under workshops, you'll see free presentations, so everything from the desert southwest um, to talking about the psychologies of photography and field planning and then this presentation will be posted as well. So with that, I think I turn it back over to you two and we'll get going on questions. Thank you so much, Nick. That was gorgeous. I just want to like, sorry, quit work and just go travel for the rest of my life, grab a camera. <laughs> um, really fantastic. And we're really grateful for you, you know, volunteering to be here and share this all with anyone, everyone. Um, so I do want to encourage anyone that has a question to either post it in the chat or in the Q&A box so we can um, 
open it up for any questions that you guys have. <clears throat> yeah, so before we do that, <clears throat> it's on the slide here, which you may not see, or um, so anyone that, I know we have you know, a mix of photographers and non-photographers on the call. Um, so anyone that is a possible collector that likes the wilding for their beautiful art, uh, any, any of the prints you see here are on my website, if you just mentioned you saw this presentation, uh, either now or anytime in the future, uh, I'll donate 15% of the gross print sale proceeds, not in the net or after profit. So whatever print you buy, 15% of the gross amount will get donated to the wildling to continue the work that they do. And, uh, Stacy mentioned it at the beginning, and I, I can't say this enough. I say it in my newsletters on a regular basis. The Wildling is so incredibly supportive of, of landscape photographers. It's really, really refreshing uh, to have such a great group, and uh, they, they really care a lot for us. It showed in the latest photo contest, which I judged. Um, the quality of the images that came in were absolutely fantastic, and the level of care that both Stacy and Lauren put into it was, was really great. So I uh, can't say enough great things about the Wildling. Honored to be part of this. Thank you so much, Thank Nick, you. for the offer of the print sale, too. So um, hopefully some of you saw some images there that you can't live without, and I'm <laughs> in that group myself. <laughs> Lauren, do you, are there any Q&As you want to uh, Sure, I can, I can start us off here. We have a question from Liz Alvarez asking, what influenced you in your youth, Nick, and encouraged you to pursue photography? Well, that's an excellent question. So I, I, Liz, you've just become my new best friend because you would consider my, if we're, if we're taking your exact definition of youth, then I would have been in my 30s when I, uh, so that's, that makes me even happier. Um, so my pursuit of photography, I've, um, I've been doing, um, I've been an adventure almost my whole life in terms of uh, mountain climbing, expedition, uh, did the sport called adventure racing, etc. Oftentimes with a disposable cheap camera or a, uh, camera that I was prone to breaking. I some of all only broken my nice camera once, but knock on wood. Um, and this was uh, a period of time I was in career transition and experiencing burnout and really discovering um, on a trip to Greece that the opportunity to really start to create images and get much more present in the scene versus taking snapshots um, was, was presenting itself. And so about four years ago was when I got, you know, very serious about my photography and started uh, approaching it more of a methodical process and learning about a lot of the principles uh, to, be, to put that forward. Um, and so I see, you know, it's, um, it's for me, it's, it's, it's wildlife, it's, it's, it's mostly, you know, nature and landscape photography for me. Um, I, I love being out there immersed in the space. And then also it's, it's teaching and working with my clients. Um, lots of fun to see people understand more about how they can improve their images, their process, et cetera. And to get people to understand really clearly that it doesn't have a timeline. Uh, photography and creativity in particular can really be something you do at any point in time in your life. And it's not something you have to be, you're not just born as a creative. Great creatives, in my opinion, are created. And there's a process to learn it. So it's a great question. Yeah, I think that's a great thing to note that we can do these things at any age because so often I think there's this idea that you have to go to art school or, you know, yeah. these very expensive classes and it's really something you can pick up at any time. So great to know that you are not for that. Exactly. Um, another question from Kevin Patterson asking, where in Northwestern Colorado did you grow up? He was yeah. raised in Eastern Utah and lived north of Grand Junction just a couple of years as an adult. Oh, nice. Okay. Yeah, I grew up in uh, Carbondale. It's in between Glenwood and Aspen in the Western part. I'll be going back um, to Colorado finally for fall colors. So I have a, a, I have a diverse mountain portfolio and a, and a great coastal portfolio. And I have like two, no, I went up to three fall color pictures. Uh, so I'll be going back there as well. So yeah, I grew up in Carbondale. I went to uh, undergrad in Fort Collins um, and then migrated to Boise there for 10 years and that that uh, other half of my um my my the equation which is my wife and uh then we migrated to san francisco we did the reverse reverse commute i guess you could say we're probably the only people to move from boise idaho to downtown san francisco <laughs> luckily found my way to slow so very cool um we had a question in the chat box from marcia asking in addition to prince um do you have an option to print on glass, metallic, or wooden frame? 
Uh, interesting question. So I, I could pick up my big 27 inch monitor and point it at the wall over there, but I can, I can, Marsha can send me an email. I have a, I have a wall over here. I've printed on wood and then I have acrylic and then I have one on canvas that actually lights up and, um, and then all the prints behind, well, actually no, most of my stuff's at hands right now, but, uh, I print primarily on metal is my preferred, but I will print on anything that clients want. And, um, and so that's a, I'm doing a, <clears throat> I, I just find metal, it's the, the lightweight and the durability of it really kind of holds it, holds out really well. So um, anything that happened, but yeah, I, I printed on wood, I printed on glass before. Awesome. All right. And we have a question from Michelle asking, how do you feel about photography using the latest iPhone cameras? Um, so I had an image, I almost put two images in here. They're with my iPhone <laughs> and uh, I have a card that sells very well at the hands gallery here, two cards in slow that sell very well that are iPhone photos. Um, so I have an iPhone 11, uh, with the triple camera on the back okay. and, um, this thing in portrait mode, um, it takes, I don't want to say better, but I'm going to kind of, I'm not an official Nikon ambassador, so I can say whatever I want. Um, it almost takes better photos of like plant portraits and other things that I can get out of my, out of my zoom lens in portrait mode, wow. um, which is really kind of fascinating. So I have a couple, um, I could probably show actually really quick, but we'll keep going. But it, it's just surprising to me how, how good the, um, the image quality is in these phones. You're not gonna be able to take uh, grand landscape photos in them and expect to print them large, but smaller scenes, um, you know, the best camera you're gonna have is the one in your pocket. And I've taught, uh, I've taught an iPhone workshop before. It was a blast, actually. And uh, I've had a couple of people ask if I teach one again, I think probably in the fall. I'll teach one online because there's so many settings in these phones these days in terms of ways to do creative things and how to edit the images. So I, I'm, uh, I'm a big believer in the smartphone uh, cameras, especially for capturing scenes or settings or whatever. Well, that's exciting to hear as an iPhone user. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, hey, Nick. Yeah. Um, you know, you had talked about shooting in raw format and do any of the cell phones allow you to do that? Yeah, you can in the, um, the iPhone does have a, it's a secondary app. It's not the primary app, um, but you can, you can get a secondary app that allows you to, to shoot in raw. Um, I haven't downloaded the app yet to, to try it just because it's been busy with everything else and the JPEGs are, they come out okay. You can still edit JPEGs that come out of the iPhone in Lightroom um, fairly well, but yeah, I'll show you actually. Just share the screen just really quick. I'm gonna show you. So this one on my screen now was taken with an iPhone. Oh. So that's with the iPhone. And then I went into you uh, Lightroom and, and added some sharpening and did some of the details, but the, the image quality is, is quite good. Um, and then one other one I can show you as well. Sorry, I don't want to spend the whole time in there, but just give people a sense. So this one is taken with an iPhone as well. And, and you would, one, how, oh, sorry. No, I'm just, go ahead. I was going to ask, so if you were to print those photos from your phone, how, about how large do you think uh, I think I could go 16 by 20. Oh, wow. So, which is, you know, some people say that's a big print, but I have 38, I have like, you know, 40 by 60 prints in my home. But yeah, you could go pretty large with that and um, same thing. So that's, that gives you a sense of what the capabilities are now. That's awesome. Um, I did, I had a question earlier I wanted to bring up too. Someone had asked about sharing the video, which obviously we'll be sharing the recording with everyone, um, but also a list of all the locations you talked about, just because some of those names are difficult to pick up, <laughs> I think I know. Um, um, yeah, I think it'd be, in, in the video, it's gonna be available probably to go through it that way versus me typing it out. And then if you have particular questions, uh, they can just email me. Um, okay. I'd be happy to, to share that, so. Awesome. I, don't, I don't have like a list per se that's like written down, so it would take me yeah. time, but I'm happy to, they, hey, where was that place again or whatever, so. Okay, great. And we had, um, Nick's email was on that end screen, and if anyone needs it, we can actually, I'll put it in the chat right here. Um, yeah, and I'll send a follow-up email out, so, with all the stuff. 
Great. That's all the questions I had, but if anyone has last questions, um, feel free to type in now or for however hold your peace <laughs> or email Nick later. Uh, I saw Michelle ask and that was with the iPhone 11. Yes. Which was, yeah, so it was iPhone 11 was the image there. I'm going to throw out a question while we're waiting to see if there's any others. Um, <clears throat> so I noticed you use Lightroom. Is Do you really recommend that as a way to keep all your stuff organized and then be able to, to edit? Yeah. So I did, um, so yeah, we got, I think we have, this is great. We're done. We're done. We're, we have time left. It's like, I'm, I'm so used to running over. I, the workshops I'm teaching have been like two and a half hours of Zoom calls and I get sick and tired of hearing myself talk. I'm sure everybody else does too. So if we're gonna be done in an hour, this is great. So I'll share my screen again. Um, share it again and I'll quickly show, cause I did a, um, I did a all about Lightroom workshop uh, two weeks two weeks ago that was uh, probably my best reviewed workshop. And I talked all about the, and it's one of the $15 um, tutorials that's on there. And so the reason I like Lightroom is, is how I have everything organized. And you can see on the left side of the screen here, um, I organized by chronological date. Uh, so where I photographed and then I keep it, it's just very, very, very well organized. So I can find things really, really quickly uh, within Lightroom. Uh, and then the import Im import function, which I talked about as well in the in the tutorial, is really straightforward. So you don't get this duplicity stuff. You don't get these other issues that can sometimes happen with um, trying to have some stuff in Lightroom and some stuff elsewhere. So uh, Lightroom is uh, I pay for the um, Adobe Pack, which includes um, Photoshop, includes Camera Raw, and it's ten bucks a month. Um, so it is, they don't have the standalone stuff anymore, but they're constantly updating. Um, they just came out with a new update recently um, of some new stuff they added, like the tone curves and some stuff they added to, you can do some other more brush adjustments, et cetera. So it's, um, I, I appreciate, it's the best, you know, the second best $10 I spend. And photo pills is $10 one time. This is 10 bucks a month, but I really, really like Lightroom. So. Thanks, Nick. And then we, we got another question from Michelle asking um, for a comparison of different iPhones. Do, does she need to have an iPhone 11? I mean, I think the cameras obviously get better and better with each model, but you know, could someone start out with some of the older phones and still get good results? Um, the triple camera um, on the, on the I, I might've been on the 10 as well. And um, maybe the others, that's what gives a lot of the depth is that the three lenses. Um, but the other ones, any of the cameras, I think it was in the eight, uh, then you started getting into the ones that have portrait mode. Um, and those are the ones so you'd have to check if you have portrait mode on your phone or if it's been brought in, uh, at a later, uh, later point in time. And so, um, that's the only thing I could say on the iPhones, the, some of the Samsungs take, can take even better photos. They're probably a little bit even ahead of the iPhones uh, in terms of what I've seen in terms of image quality. My uh, husband has a Samsung and I have an iPhone and we're always comparing and I think he has the better camera. Oh, <laughs> I hate to say it. That's been recorded, Lauren, so. <laughs> um, we have another question asking um, where the best spots are to photograph Montaña de Oro. If you have specific tips on that. Yeah, so everything, I've, I've, um, I've had great luck everywhere from the, uh, uh, Hazard Beach is where you can drive, where the, you see right in the eucalyptus, uh, you can go down there. It's better at low, low tide there. Um, and then if you park at the far end down by the PG&E property, um, which is kind of the bluff, they call it more the bluffs, in the, regardless of tide and in particular with storms. So a couple of the storm images I showed were in that kind of southern area of Montana Doro. Um, they're higher up on the bluffs, but you can kind of walk around some areas there and that, that area, that, that place is really great for storms or higher tides. The lower tide hazard beach has some really interesting rocks and some of the other stuff. Um, just as soon as you get away from the, the main central area, which is where the Spooner Cove, 
you'll just, you, the people just drop off like crazy. Like 95% of the people go to Spooner Cove, which is beautiful. But as you get to the other areas, it just becomes really, 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 really nice. Awesome. Um, we have another question. This is again, technicalities, but um, for your printing on metal, do you do it yourself or do you send it out to a print company? Um, I use either Bay Photo or McKenna uh, to do my metal prints. And for my, anyone that does a private uh, work, does a private class of two hours, I give them a print code for a $60 uh, free print. Um, and I'm doing a, a preparing your images for print workshop next week that's sold, or excuse me, next week. The guy's like, what? Tomorrow. We do it on Thursday. It's sold out. Um, I'd probably be able to offer the recording of that one. So it's a good way to try their, their stuff basically for free. And then you get my whole print workflow. Um, and metal printing is, it's a very sophisticated process because it's actually fused into the, me into the metal. It's onto aluminum and it's uh, pretty complicated. So I wouldn't, I have my, so we're that way, can't quite see it. I have a, what is it, Canon Pro 100 that prints up to 11 by 14s. Um, so I'll use that for test prints or selling folio prints like at the Wildling. Um, it's nice, but um, yeah, the, the bigger metals, I would I send those out. Awesome. All right, any other last questions from the audience? Okay. Any other last questions? Looks like we're through, but I want to say thank you again, Nick. It's always such a pleasure working with you, and we're very excited that Nick is our judge, um, or juror, rather, for our Critters of the Tri-County show, which is coming in September. Um, he's been jurying photos for us. We had over 200 entries, so he diligently looked at all of them and he's going to be selecting winners for us and we can look forward to seeing that in September. So it'll be only online, unfortunately, because of COVID, but um, still an awesome show. So stay yeah, tuned. Yeah, it's great. It was a lot of fun. So yeah, so bribes, bribes can't be accepted. I don't know who you are. Yes, so, uh, <laughs> it was blind and blind uh, entry. So he didn't know while he was judging either. So. Yeah, you can send retroactive bribes later if you want. Uh, oh, one question that's not giving me, are metal prints the same as aluminum prints? Um, yes, they're the same as metal, I would say they're the same as aluminum prints. It's printed on uh, aircraft aluminum, um, but it's not, it's a lot different than metallic. Uh, metallic is the metallic type of paper and metal prints is actually fused on the metal, so. And then Kevin from the Wild Wolf, absolutely. Thank you, Kevin. So, well, thank you again, Nick, so much. We so appreciate it. Um, I hope some of you buy some of his prints. I think I'll be shopping later myself. Um, and if any of you are moved to support us at all for um, this free webinar, that would be great. Um, we uh, have been closed now for over four months, so things are a little challenging these days, like they are for uh, really everybody. And uh, we just look forward to being able to open before hopefully too long. We'll see what the governor and the county say about that. Um, and uh, just meanwhile, we're really happy to be able to offer this kind of quality programming to everybody. And uh, thank you, Nick, once again. It was awesome. Yeah. Perfect. All right. Thanks, guys, and enjoy the rest of our Tuesday. All right. <laughs> Thanks. Bye. Bye, everyone.